Jung for this very kind introduction and good morning and also thank you for the invitation. Uh, it is a great opportunity for me to uh, tell you about my research. Uh, so as Jung has uh, already mentioned, I have been working uh, on the probabilistic model of check at prison. Uh, so I have been working uh, with probability and to apply model checking to probabilistic systems for about 15 years, a bit more than that. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, what a new project uh, working with engineers is taking me towards, and that is to what extent we can apply probabilistic model checking uh, in the context of mobile model. Um, and as always in my work, I have focused but not only on developing the theory, the theory that underpins probabilistic model checking, um, but mainly on taking that theory towards the software tools, software tools that then can be applied by others in various contexts. Um, so the, I wanted to begin by making a statement that should not surprise you, and that is mobile autonomy is here. Uh, so the vision of robots, robotic assistants, uh, that are going to do everything for us, this vision has been realized. Uh, and we know that people in various countries are already letting these robotic assistants into their homes. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe they can't just water your plants yet, but uh, uh, I mean, they are becoming companions for the earth. Really. And of course, another example, and maybe you know, here not everybody still sees them, the Google car, the Google car, according to Wendy Zhu from Stanford, is uh, the vanguard of mobile robotics. This is a mobile robot and it's driving around in California right now. Uh, so I wanted you to pause and think about this situation and ask yourself a question. Are we safe? Uh, as you know, there is embedded software at the heart of the device. Uh, there isn't just a single microprocessor. There are probably hundreds of microprocessors, and there are hundreds in ordinary cars. There will be hundreds uh, in, in the Google car. Uh, on top of that, we also have sensors, so we have a lot of uncertainty. And what you do not want to see is the blue screen. In particular, you know, as for example, uh, you are being driven by a Google car, perhaps even in something much simpler, uh, like you know, uh, doing a self-parking method. Uh, so, what if? Yeah. Can yeah. I make a quick comment? So, yeah. I do hardware design. So, can we say embedded hardware is the heart of the device, um, and then embedded software is the blood? <laughs> <laughs> So because you need the hardware to do the computation. <laughs> the software doesn't do it right by itself. Yes, that's a, that's a very fair comment. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, as a computer scientist, I tend to work with the blood. Okay. <laughs> uh, right, so if you, um, you know, you are wondering whether I'm imagining this. Well, if you uh, have been reading the news and you would have heard, this is not the Google car, this is Tesla. Tesla has an autopilot mode, and there have been several reports about software going wrong while Tesla is driving an autopilot. And in fact, this is still under investigation, but it has also been a fatal crash. Uh, so my question is, can we do better? And what is it that we can do? There is software everywhere, okay, blood <laughs> or not, there is software, the software is designed by computer scientists like me and perhaps computer science students, uh, you know, taught by me and many others, uh, but at the same time, users expect predictability.
reliability and high integrity. Predictability and high integrity. And this is in the presence of a lot of uncertainty. There could be component failure. There is a lot of environmental uncertainty due to sensors uh, changing situation. If you think about driving on the road, you have other cars and the traffic changing constantly. But this uncertainty can be quantified. It can be quantified probabilistically. So we can, under some reasonable assumptions, talk about the probability of failure. Perhaps we might also need to bring in some statistical observations uh, to validate these probabilities, but this is possible. Uh, and from that, we can then talk about quantitative probabilities. We can express safety and reliability based on the statistical observations as, okay, the probability of something bad happening is very small. You will not be able to rule it out completely, uh, but you will be able to brand it and make it small. For example, the probability of an airbag failing to deploy within you know, uh, some fraction of a second. Uh, and uh, what people like me bring in into this context is quantitative verification. Quantitative verification uh, takes these quantitative properties, expresses them in terms of temporal logic, but with quantities, and by quantities here I now mean probability, but also real time, other aspects, energy constraints, etc. Uh, and we bring in formal verification, which is a way to construct mathematical proofs that state that some system satisfies the specification. In other words, safe or reliable. Um, so quantitative verification that I have focused on is model-based. What we do is we work with models of systems. Uh, where do these models come from? Well, they can either be derived, for example, from protocols, from requirements uh, and you know developed, uh, but they can also be extracted from code. So if you have legacy software, it is also possible to reverse engineer models from that. And they can also be used at runtime. So this is not just a design time operation, it's even a design time, but then you can also maintain them, and especially for self-adaptive systems. This is essential. You need to maintain them at that. Uh, so models, on the one hand. On the other hand, we need to have specifications. And we tend to specify them. We, call, we can call them goals. We call them objectives. <coughs> and we write them in terms of temporal logic. But this is a temporal logic which is extended with probability of real time. So for example, uh, reliability can be written as an alert signal will be delivered with high probability within 10 milliseconds. And if this is in-car communication, okay, um, uh, or an energy property, the maximum expected energy consumption in one hour is at most 10 microamperes. And this is for autonomous Um now, what uh, I have focused on is uh, this notion of model-based design. So we work with models of systems rather than systems themselves. Uh, and I work on automated verification via model checking. So this is formal verification where the proofs are done by a tool such as a model checker. Chris is an example of such a model checker, but Hukal and various others, SMB, are also examples of model checkers. So we do proofs automatically by another piece of software. Um, and we do proofs of these specifications, um, but the context that I'm working with now uh, is also uh, forcing me to consider strategy synthesis. Uh, this is a way, this is to people from control, it's known as a controller, so it's controller synthesis, controller generation. Um, I come and use games. So that's why um, we use strategies. So to give you a picture of uh, quantitative probabilistic verification, I have a model of the system. Okay? 
uh, why not? Actually, when I met John last time, someone proposed uh, uh, the idea of building a model of the car just be before I was giving my talk. Okay? In theory, it is possible. Consider all the components and the way that they connect. Of course, it's a huge undertaking, but perhaps assuming some kind of compositional reasoning, contract based reasoning, it will become possible. Now you need to then represent this model somehow, and in my world these models will focus on probabilities and perhaps aspects like real time energy. Uh, so this is an example of the Markov chain where uh, I move between the states according to probabilities. And then there is the specification. Okay, so this specification is now written in temporal logic. And you need to read P as the probabilistic operator. So I say with probability at most 0.01, F means future eventually, within time T, eventually within time T. This means that the probability of uh, my car crashing in time T is small. Okay? Uh, you will not be able to rule it out completely, even though you may want to say my car will never crash, uh, but in probabilistic logic the best that we can do is to make that probability small. Then when you put these two into the probabilistic model checker, it will build the representation of the model and turn it into an algorithm, um, run an algorithm on it, and produce a result which is say yes, this property is true or not. Where did you put the requirement that the car has to go somewhere? Because the way that I would prevent my car from crashing is no, by putting it in the garage and leaving it there. Uh, you are actually perfectly right. That's why this, this is what uh, quantitative verification does. But I can also give it a, a property, a similar kind of property, and I will get to that. And then what it will produce is a strategy. Okay. Uh, I need models with decisions, but I get onto that. So I want then a property saying, okay, the high probability of the probability one I want to get. Now, historically speaking, uh, probabilistic model checking is not uh, young because it started with people like Moshe Vardy and Cotton Betis and Diana Kakis in the 1980s. And then the first implementations were produced at the beginning of the 1990s. But it wasn't until 2000 when general purpose tools were released and then taken out. And I mentioned here just two, but there are several PRISM and ETM CC, um, uh, which has now changed its name because uh, it is now called uh, NRMC, Mark of the Board. Uh, but now, mature, uh, it is a mature area and of industrial relevance, and this is partly because of the success of these tools in actually showing that you can use them to find real bugs in uh, 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 these applications. So we have found uh, flaws, and other people have found flaws. For example, Vitaly Shpatikov has found the flaw in an anonymity protocol which uses probability using um, so these have been found and corrected, and if you are interested, you can read about it on the web page. But uh, what I want to do with this talk is I want to question the work that I've done in the past from the point of view of the new application in mobile photography. So, so far, uh, we have worked with models which are Markov chains, so I have discrete states, and the idea is that I can jump between the states according to probability distributions. They could be discrete probability distributions, so or they could be continuous probability distributions, with exponentials or continuous step But there are no decisions. Everything happens probabilistically in our systems. Another example is a lot of decision process, which is often used in robotics. I have uh, probability distribution, so I can still move from a state according to a probability distribution. That means I can go from a state and end up in several states with pre-designed probabilities. But I also have decisions. 
So these decisions is what control controllers then have to decide when they get to the state, they have to choose one of those. Uh, and uh, you know, this is what market decision process is about. From a basic automata is another variant we are familiar with Opal. These are time automata, but now transitions can happen probabilistically. So they have discrete probability distributions of moving from a state, which is the location, to other locations, but in addition they have real time passage. And they still have the decisions which are known as non-determinism in that context. And of course, you know, bringing you to the closer to the control theory background, what we want to do really is we want to model continuous flows because, I mean, traffic, uh, you know, the, the, the spatial properties, real time, and this is much less developed uh, in verification, and that's why I, I refer to it as towards stochastic continuous space hybrid systems, uh, known as stochastic hybrid systems or the good mark of processes. Uh, but mobile autonomy gives us unique challenges. Now, in autonomous systems, uh, well, they are reactive and they have to continuously interact with other agents, so other autonomous agents or humans. Um, and if you think about the Google car driving, you know, along the motorway, there will be other cars, there will be pedestrians, you know, perhaps, uh, and the Google car will need to interact with them, um, but uh, the goals may conflict, because the car may want to get from A and B, but the pedestrian will want to cross the road, okay? So the goals may conflict, and there may be adversarial behavior between them. Now, each of these agents is autonomous. Autonomous means that they have the power to take decisions. And in taking those decisions, they have to consider the context. And the context then <coughs> includes all the other agents in the environment. So if you take the sort of traditional uh, robotics view of planning with market decision processes, they consider uncertainty, but the environment in the MDP view is static, because it does not contain other agents. Okay? And the shift that you know, I'm focusing on is let, allow, uh, uh, let us allow to have autonomous agents in the uh, environment as well. Uh, and for that, uh, what we do is we adopt a game theoretical view. So we now consider a situation, otherwise known as multi-agent systems, where agents play games, strategize, so agents exert their control via strategies, and strategies have to consider other active agents as well. Uh, so we want to distinguish between uncontrollable and controllable events or events is where the agents make the decisions. And there are many occurrences in practice of games. Uh, I focus on multiplayer games and games with stochasticity, but a lot of these results are uh, also apply to non-stochastic games. But what is a game? Well, I mean, I wanted to appeal to your own understanding of what a game is. Well, in a game, we have, a, we have players, we have a number of players. You can talk about two-player games or multi-player games. Um, and um, players uh, make moves, uh, and they can be turn-based, uh, or they can be concurrent. Uh, so chess is a turn-based game, uh, and rock, paper, scissors is a concurrent game. Uh, um, now, each player has a strategy, and the strategy uh, is essentially a plan or a controller for how to choose moves based on the information available, and that information includes how the other agents played the game. There is also a value, we also call it a payoff, 
Um, so it could be <coughs> energy usage in a quarter game or demand in a one. And the key uh, um, aspect that is studied in games is is there a winning strategy? Uh, now, if you think that this um, game theoretic point of view is rather far-fetched for my scenario, uh, here is what actually Google said in response to another accident. There was a minor accident uh, uh, that the Google car had, not this one, it, uh, uh, it was uh, um, um, another one, but uh, uh, it collided with a bus and for the first time Google admitted that it was their fault all the other uh, crashes that happened before were the fault of the drivers but not of the Google car and uh, Google at that point has recognized that you do need this kind of negotiation so you do need to consider the situation from the game theory <coughs> Um, so that's why I'm focusing on uh, this model. So what I want to do with this lecture is I want to put forward the plastic multiplayer games. You can also think about them as uh, multi-agent systems, the plastic multi-agent systems, as an appropriate modeling abstraction for competitive behavior. So it's behavior that doesn't just focus on, it will include cooperation cooperative games but it will also include adversarial behavior because we have to recognize the fact that there are potential conflicts and explicitly i want to talk about stochasticity uh, because that's how i want to capture the failure for going failure for example sense of uncertainty and i will uh, tell you about properties so i will uh, elaborate on the single objective properties I mentioned, uh, but I will also talk about multi-objective properties and towards the end I will say how we do compositional strategy synthesis based on SEO guarantee contracts. And there is a tool support, so Prism Games is an extension of Prism and you can um, find it on the Prism um, Web page. I will also, if I have time, I'll share you uh, the typical examples that we have studied. Okay, so what is a stochastic multiplayer game? Uh, in a stochastic game, we have, as I mentioned, <coughs> multiple players uh, and they are competitive, okay, so they can be adversarial. Uh, but in some situations, they will also collaborate. So if you think about the Google car, in a sense all its components have to collaborate. Uh, but if you think about you know a Google car versus a pedestrian, that's a potentially conflicting behavior and it needs to be we need a, a more involved negotiation. But there is also going to be non-determinism. Uh, so there will be decisions that the uh, the players have to make. Uh, and essentially control the environment um, um, and will be prevalent. Now, from the uh, point of view of the theory, game theory, the games that I'm considering are very simple. They are only turn based for now, uh, discrete time, zero time, and complete observation with one minor difference. Uh, and the reason I'm only focusing on those is because that's what the tool supports. There is a lot more theory available, uh, but there has not been a uh, uh, you know, tool development that corresponds to it. Now, games are, of course, widely studied, uh, but more importantly, they are now coming into applications, and even in the systems, not just the model-based, uh, but in the systems applications. So I mentioned autonomous traffic, but consider distributed <coughs> cooperation where you have selfish agents and unselfish control synthesis. That's something that would be well familiar to uh, uh, you know engineering people with an engineering background. But in security, now people are considering explicitly games between the defender of the system and an attacker. 
doesn't zero sum conflict with the examples? Pedestrian crossing the road in your car. Yeah, Surely you want both to happen. It would certainly be oversimplistic. Yes, you are absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, I think in, the, in general you want to consider a more general national equilibrium. <coughs> at the moment, the two economics support the simple national equilibrium. So a stochastic multiplayer game, again, formally, if you are familiar with multiple decision processes, uh, I can explain it as follows. So if you take a multiple decision process uh, and it's discrete, so it has <coughs> finite many when we talk about finite, finite in many states, and in each state it will have a number of probability distributions available, and that's the decision point. Okay, so that state, when you come to that state, the system will have to decide. Uh, but what I uh, do to turn it into a turn-based stochastic multiplayer game is that I partition the state. And the partitioning here is represented by colors. So I have three players, blue, green, and the yellow player. Okay? But it's a partition, so there is only one player that controls the state. And it's a simplified notion of the game. There is no reason why the theory couldn't work for the current games, but at the moment the tools support just uh, uh, turn-based games. Um, uh, so what you can also see here is that these uh, probability distributions, okay, they are labeled with action names. So here you can make a decision between A and B. If I choose B, then with these probabilities I jump to those states. Um, and I also have labeling with atomic propositions, which at the moment is omitted, let's think about this. This is like hitting my jackpot, okay? So this is, this is just an example of an atomic proposition. So this is what a stochastic multiplayer game is. Um, I can also annotate such a game with what we call rewards or costs. And they can measure um, uh, various aspects like time, power consumption, etc. And I consider two types of rewards. You either label states with uh, these reward values, um, like energy consumption, you can make it time dependent or not, uh, or action. So, uh, for example, the amount of energy that's consumed by taking a particular action. And for these games, then I can work with a variety of quantitative objectives. So if you uh, think of a game and the game is running, you can compute the expected cumulative total over the run. That's one example. Uh, another example which is known as the mean payoff or average, long run average behavior is where you normalize, so divide by uh, the number of steps to get the mean payoff. But dividing by the number of steps is inadequate to model, uh, for example, things like fuel usage, because you may want to normalize, you may want to divide by uh, you know, the distance, <coughs> and for those, we use ratio reports. And there are more, many more of these, uh, but I'm not covering them, not in the talk. And um, but, you know, of course I mentioned. So if I take a stochastic multiplayer game, and that picture, to represent its dynamic behavior, uh, what I do is I start in the initial state, there's a distinguished initial state with a set of probability distribution on them, and you unfold it into a set of, for simplicity, just infinite sequences, of connected states. So you start in the initial state, you choose one probability distribution, you move according to the probability distribution that you carry. Uh, and you can um, assume that it's sufficient just to look at infinite states because I'm going to say, well, if there's a deadlock, I'm going to put a certain command on the deadlocking state. Okay? Um, now, so these are, so if you take a, so 
stochastic magic play again, we can represent it as a set of these paths. Um, but then for each player, you can formulate a strategy. And a strategy in general will be a function which will take a history, which is just a finite computation, which ends in the state of that player. That's what this one is saying, just ends in the state of that player. And then this player makes a choice, and the choice is represented as a probability distribution over the possible decision. In general, it's a probability distribution, so you can make decisions probabilistically, but of course, you know, if you take the right distributions, you can simply select one of these and one and everything else. The probability is zero. And notice that this is uh, history dependent. So uh, deterministic would be, which is the, the one probability distribution one, okay, direct distribution. You can talk about memoryless strategies. They are strategies that make the same choice every time you come to the state. They ignore the history. Uh, but for history dependent, you can distinguish between finite, okay, finite memory and infinite. Uh, now, if you take a strategy for each player, this is called a strategy okay? Strategy. Um, and um, for a strategy play time, uh, because every player has resolved the choice in each state, we have removed non-determinants and decisions. So you can simply take a multiplayer game under a strategy play time, and you can unfold it into a discrete time map of chain and the states of that map of chain are going to be histories. So it's not going to be finite, it will be counted the infinite, but the states of that map of chain will be histories. And in uh, uh, this map of chain then we can reason about the events in the game okay, by computing probabilities in that probability space of that map of chain. You can also compute expectations. So because I've taken paths, you can then sum up the rewards you see over the path. You can you know, divide them by the number of steps followed an average or uh, of a ratio. Okay? So that's the idea. But now what I want to do is I want to bring in a specification. And this is a temporal logic, but this temporal logic we call it RPATL, Reward Probabilistic Automating Temporal Logic. And this logic inherits from uh, the logic ATL, which is Automating Temporal Logic. And the thing that it takes from that logic is the coalition. A coalition is a set of agents. Um, it also um, takes a probabilistic operator from the logic PCTL. So this is like the one that I showed you on the, on the uh, uh, earlier slide. The bow tag here stands for a comparison operator. So I have, you can talk this is the probabilistic operator. Uh, takes a path formula psi and uh, compares it to a probability factor. So Q is a probability factor. Uh, so this means the probability of ensuring psi along the computation space here. And you also have a reward operator which takes the reward formula as a parameter, and other than that, this is just a bound on the reward. And this is an example, okay? So the coalition, so player one and player two are in coalition, and this property that says that player one and two have a strategy to ensure that the probability of an error occurring within 10 steps is less than at least 0.01. That's, uh, that's a type of that. Okay? And this is regardless of the strategies of other players. And that's the important addition. So you have the path modifiers also the, from CPL, or are you replacing the path modifier by the probability, probability operator, the coalition operator? Uh, no, no, we also have them, but it's a simplified logic. Okay. Yes, so we don't have. I mean, the PCT is based on CTM, so we still have some. So I'm showing you here, this is a bastardized version of the logic, so I'm going to show you. Uh, 
uh, the topology. Uh, so what you take, if we have the probabilistic operator and the reward operator, and the reward comes in two variants because we have the reward for the ratio of reward, okay? And the parameters for rewards are cumulative or long-run average in there, okay? And for psi, I'm only showing you the intuitivity, but of course here I can put in the full LTM. Okay. Um, uh, you can also add uh, the, the path quantifiers, but then the logic becomes part of the ATS star. Um, and so this is just simply the reachability, okay, in there. So, uh, and this is an example of players in coalition C have a collective strategy to ensure that the game reaches an end point almost sure it's the collective one. Um, the ratio, ratio is simply takes two uh, what we call reward structures, so these are two functions that map uh, states and actions of a stochastic game to the values and computes the ratio of these and compares it to this And a, a, a sort of a, a, an appropriate example is expected longer fuel consumption per time. As you can guess, you know, counting the number of steps is not going to give you that. And it's a proper generalization. You cannot express it in terms of just plain now, for the semantics of the logic, well, I'm assuming that you already know that that's how you may just explain the intuition. Uh, I'll just focus on the PFR operators, okay? And for RPHL, what we do is, because we focus on coefficient uh, we are going to assume that for a fixed coalition, I can build a two-player game where I take the game um, uh, and the, the first player of the two-player game is just the players in the, the original coalition and the, the second player is everybody else. Okay? The second player is everybody else. So for a fixed coalition, and there is also one other assumption which is independence of strategies to actually make this go through in a decided fashion rather than undecided fashion. And then I can define that this coalition property is true in a state of G if in the coalition game, that is where I collapsed the coalition into one player and everybody else, there exists a strategy for the coalition, such as for all strategies of the other players, this probability bound Q is made. Okay. So this means, in other words, regardless of the other players, I win. I have a strategy which allows me to win against all strategies of the other players, with the exception of Okay. And here's an example to test your understanding. So this is the same game that I've showed you about. And I have a property. So this is just the yellow player here in the coalition, does that player have a strategy to get to the jackpot? That means eventually, in future eventually, the probability at least a quarter? Any guesses? Any guesses? Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes, very good. Um, but does it have a strategy to reach a probability one third? Because the other two players can play at the same But if the yellow player gets into a coalition with one of these, okay, uh, it can increase that okay? Of course, they would then have to share the jackpot, but, <laughs> but you can think about it. You see, that's how you know they. Google Car can make its components collaborate in order to, you know, win against other cars. 
Right, so this is just the basic idea. The two main problems that we <coughs> study for stochastic games is not just verification, it's verification and strategy synthesis. So the verification problem takes in a game and the specification, which is the PHL property type, and asks the question, does the game satisfy the Okay, and this is what I just said. That means, does there exist a coalition, a strategy for the coalition which wins against everybody else. Um, but the synthesis problem is dual, okay, which is find that. If it exists, find that, and this is what you may recognize as controversy. But you also give it again an approach. And these reduce computing optimal values and winning strategies in two player games because we consider this for a fixed coalition, we can have nesting of the coalitions as well. Um, and in, typically, this employs value iteration, which is a generalization of the value iteration and, and sort of reasonably straightforward generalization, which was done by Ant Condor, um, of value iteration for MDPs. Uh, and we can show that both players have optimal strategies, that is, coalition and everybody else, and it turns out that memory is less deterministic strategies. Surprise for reachability. If I give you step value property, then you need finite memory strategies. And you can also extract. Oh, I yeah, no. going to express surprise that the, the problems of NP, but maybe you want to finish your thought here. And then. Yes, I have. So this is. It's, actually even worse. I've not shown you all the variants of the F operators that I really cut it down for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, it's for one time it's not. Um, uh, and this is what the value iteration looks like. So it's um, basically mi minimize or maximize depending on whether the state is controlled by the coalition so minimize corresponds to take the worst case and maximize take the best case. And you know you just do it by integrating over this. And it's very similar to the report. Okay? But this was just for single objects. Sorry, the uh, the computation value iteration, of course value iteration is approximate, so you have to compute it up to some epsilon. But value iteration uh, and the number of go up and down. Not in value integration. Once you've constructed the system, all you have to do is to integrate uh, a big matrix like vector. Um, but the dimension of the uh, Well, I mean, of course, yes. So it's the size of the state space, yes. The size of the state space is It's an exponential problem. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, but yes, we do not get for that. That's why I'm, I'm bringing in a security. And the other question I have is, so far you haven't given us any real time. <coughs> no, because I'm, I'm not going to, and Prism Games doesn't satisfy them. Uh, what you can do is you work with something like a tool, tool like Pupa, and you find a discrete price, for example, by a digital clock. But then you go even higher. Yeah. Yes, unfortunately, yes, because Uh, but another um, class of properties that I wanted to mention is multi-objective properties. In many cases, single objective properties are not enough. Uh, if you uh, think about it, um, if, even if we, we are talking about something like the Google car, okay, so the Google car, the primary objective is to get from A to B. Okay? But there is also another objective, and uh, it has to be that same. So what you want to do naturally is you want to consider a conjunction of properties, okay? Safety and getting from A to B, okay? Uh, but this is not the same as taking a conjunction in the logic RPATL because each of these would have separate probability factors, okay? So this is what we call multi-objective 
they are also known as multi-dimensional uh, because you want to take the you know the, the properties in uh, uh, for for each for each of them. So if I if I go if I go to this problem particularly with constraint based reason and satisfiability. Yeah. How is it going to happen? Uh, if you go to this problem, well, we have probabilities. If you do it with probabilities. So I take my rules of the train, and I do a train based vision with this or like it, and I can do for at least a set by the And am I far from what you do? Um, okay, I don't know. I think I probably need to think about it. Because for some rules, yes. like, if the rules have any structure, like if I say you don't send it in or anything, you go to, to this Arabic uh, framework, which is uh, the existing rules, then you can actually have some success. Right, so, so I, okay, so I, I just explained them. Um, this yes. works. Yes. Okay, so this works with um, a number, so for, for a multi objective, so you have an N formula property. We have to work with vectors of n dimensions, and you can do it by value iteration in these n dimensions. Uh, and value iteration again, you need to consider every state. So for each state, you will be approximating the probability by something similar to value iteration. Uh,
some assumptions. So if the ratio of R1 over RC is than V1 in one component, and in the other one component it's the same assumption, but you have different galaxies, you need different bands of the galaxies, then you can compose it into this variable. And of course, I've given you an example of things going wrong. 